We don't need Metrolinx. The head of it is getting $850,000 a year. It's called intergovernmental cooperation. We see it all the time on other issues. There's no reason why we can't just have municipalities working together to have transit projects done. Hello, everyone. My name is Carson Binda, and I'm the British Columbia Director for the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, holding down the fort here in rainy Vancouver. I'm joined by my very good friend and colleague today, Dr. Jay Goldberg. Uh, Jay, you know, I've been hearing the name Phil Verster in the news a lot. Uh, I've seen that uh, Metrolinx, the, the crown corporation in, in Ontario responsible for transit and transit infrastructure, has been in the news a lot. So uh, can you just run us through what's going on with Phil Verster and Metrolinx over in Ontario? Yeah, so Phil Verster has been in the news a fair bit lately here in Ontario, and it is because of his insane salary, number one, uh, and also the insane jump in his salary, number two. And then, of course, later in the show, we know for sure we're going to chat about uh, some of the failed projects uh, and reasons for the fact that for Mr. Verster, maybe he shouldn't even have uh, the job he's currently in, let alone be getting all these pay raises. But he was hired in 2017 to uh, take over Metrolink, which, as you mentioned, is the transit infrastructure uh, crown agency uh, overseeing the GTA and transit project here in the greater Toronto area. Uh, but his salary since uh, five years ago has gone up by 52% in the past five years from about $500,000, which is already insanely high, that's half a million bucks, uh, all the way to about $851,000. And so... I think a lot of people in Ontario have been very frustrated with this. Um, obviously, there's a few reasons. Metrolink hasn't been performing, but, you know, there's so many people here that are barely making ends meet. You know, we know grocery prices are soaring. It's harder to fill up your tank at the gas pump. And yet we're seeing bureaucrats, uh, really these greedflation bureaucrats, to use a Jagmeet Singh term, uh, just really fleecing taxpayers. And the idea that his salary has gone up by over $350,000 just in the last five years. And again, we'll talk about the lack of performance uh, in a few moments, but the fact that that has gone up in a period of time, and we're seeing seven, eight, nine percent inflation, food inflation through the roof, gas prices, you know, we can't afford to fill up our gas tanks. And, uh, you know, this guy's out making $850,000 a year. So uh, people are really upset about this. Uh, it, it just seems like, He's very out of touch, that the government is very out of touch because they're defending giving him a salary that big and giving him all those raises. Uh, and so, yeah, that's kind of what set people off here. Um, you know, uh, just this this massive pay hike and the massive take home pay that we're seeing with Mr. Verster. Yeah, I mean, listen, a bureaucrat getting more than $800,000 a year when at the same time as one in five Canadians are going without food. Uh, at the same time that everyone is struggling with these huge costs of living increases. I mean, I was at the supermarket yesterday and I was watching a family put back a gallon of milk because they just couldn't afford it right now because of those sky high prices. Now, I know the, the public sector operates under a little bit different rules and norms, but over here in, in the private sector, your, your salary, your raises, your bonuses are usually tied in with your performance. Now, I've never heard of anyone in the private sector getting a 52%, I think you said, pay raise overnight. But um, has Verster performed well for his $800,000 a year salary? I mean, that's about eight median Canadian families. Is Phil Verster working harder than eight normal Canadian families to deserve that massive salary? That's right. You're saying family. So that's about potentially 16 people uh, in average jobs in the private sector. But no, he has not been performing and Metrolink hasn't been performing. So, you know, again, even to see a, a small uh, increase in pay based on Metrolink's performance, I don't even think Mr. Verster uh, deserves that, let alone uh, the 52% pay increase we've seen. And let me just give you a few examples. We've got the signature Ontario line. Doug Ford has been pushing for the subway line east to west through the heart of Toronto. He's been pushing for it since he became premier. The cost has gone up from $12 billion to $20 billion. That's a 75% cost increase. And it's still years and years away from being completed. And in some places, the shovels aren't even in the ground yet. So uh, that's a huge cost. That's something Metrolinx is in charge of. 
That's something that Phil Verster is in charge of. Uh, another example, we have the Eglinton Crofton LRT, another east-west project. Now, this project goes all the way back to when I was an undergrad more than 10 years ago. Uh, I was taking the bus across the street, Eglinton. The project was already underway. It's still going on. It's years and years behind schedule and way overpriced. Uh, so again, there's another failure. And then if you don't want to just look at the city of Toronto, you can look, for example, the cities of uh, Burlington and Oakville. We're looking to get a railway bypass put in. Uh, Metrolinx has put in charge of that project. It is three times the cost of what it should have been. Uh, and what that means is that people in both of those cities have seen property tax hikes because, of course, municipalities in Ontario cannot run deficits. So what we're seeing is tax hikes at the local level for all of uh, Phil Verster and Metrolinx mistakes. And then we're seeing bigger deficits at the provincial level because of these mistakes. Unfortunately, Doug Ford still says he has a lot of confidence in Mr. Verster. He is still giving Phil Verster this $850,000 salary, which again has been the result of eight pay raises over the past four years. Um, so he's definitely not deserving of it. And uh, those are just a few examples of exactly why Metrolinx is failing. And, you know, whoever is in charge should not be getting any kind of a raise, let alone 52%. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, it sounds like absolutely everything that Phil Verster and Mes Metrolinx touches turns into an absolute train wreck. Sorry, pun intended. Um, now, but that leads me to another question. I'm sitting here scratching my head. It sounds like everything they do comes in over budget and behind schedule. Uh, do you think Metrolinx is even needed? Like, does it provide good value for money for, for folks, taxpayers in the greater Toronto area? Like, what, what is its job? What does it do? Yeah, I would say no and no. Uh, so Metrolinx was created in 2006. The McGinty government created it. So this was basically to uh, allow for when, you know, there's transit projects linking multiple municipalities. That way, there's sort of like a, you know, a bigger uh, transit uh, authority overseeing this. But the reality is, look, we've seen, uh, you know, well over 15 years of behind schedule, over budget. Uh, they've just been falling down on every possible job. And so I think the conclusion we need to make now is the Metrolink experiment has failed. Um, listen, before 2006, there were still a lot of transit projects that were done. Uh, they were started and finished without Metrolinx. We can do it again. And frankly, if there's a transit project that's linking multiple municipalities, you know, the two municipalities or, or, or three or four, you know, can work together and figure out a way to work it out. But we do not need this larger authority that is just, you know, more bureaucracy and more red tape more salaries, uh, and, you know, the head of it is getting $850,000 a year. We don't need Metrolinx. You know, again, we succeeded before 2006. You can do it again, and it's called intergovernmental cooperation. We see it all the time on other issues. There's no reason why we can't just have municipalities working together to have transit projects done. Yeah, well, Jay, let me tell you, when it comes to transit authorities, thinking taxpayers are an endless well of cash and tapping us dry, uh, you folks over in the greater Toronto area are not alone. Here in BC, we've got a very similar crown corporation called TransLink. And TransLink is famously wasteful. I mean, time and time and time again, TransLink has shown us and shown everyone in British Columbia that they are simply too wasteful to be trusted with another dime of taxpayer money. You know, it was so bad that over here in 2015, our longtime supporters will remember this, uh, TransLink, tried to, or TransLink tried to bring in an additional sales tax uh, to fund all their wasteful spending, to fund those fat, uh, exorbitant executive salaries. Now, our supporters came out like David against Goliath with these people. Uh, we forced TransLink to hold a referendum on their spending, to hold a referendum on this, on this out-of-control tax hike that they were proposing. And let me tell you, Jay, our supporters pulled through. We managed to beat TransLink. We managed to stop them from bringing in that new, uh, that new sales tax hike. But let me tell you what these sneaky bureaucrats over at TransLink did next. They, uh, they couldn't bring in a new sales tax. They lost that uh, at the ballot box. So they increased the carbon tax 
that they charge drivers in the lower mainlands. Now, Jay, this blows my mind, but over here in uh, in Greater Vancouver, in the lower mainland of British Columbia, we're paying about 75 cents a liter in gas Oof. taxes at the pump. 75 cents. I mean, that's jaw-dropping. Those are the highest gas taxes, not just in Canada, not just in the Great White North, but across North America. It's mm-hmm. crazy. And of that shocking, eye-watering 75 cents a liter gas tax, well, TransLink gets 18 and a half cents a liter of that. It's a slap in the face. They weren't able to bring in their sales tax increase, but those sneaky bureaucrats got their pound of flesh anyways. They uh, increased the taxes we pay on gas. Now, TransLink is famously wasteful. Any lower mainlander will tell you that TransLink wastes money like no one else. But even with TransLink, even with famously wasteful TransLink, their CEO makes just about half of what Phil Burster does. Uh, That's crazy. It's crazy. I got to say, Carson, we can't beat you when it comes to the gas tax. Thank gosh we do not have a transit municipal uh, tax here in Toronto, Greater Toronto area. And, and please, I do hope that John Tory closes his ears for those few seconds where we just mentioned that. I don't want him to get any ideas. Uh, but yeah, your gas tax is about 20 cents a liter more than ours. So can't complain there, but I can complain. Well, I mean, I can't complain because the carbon tax sucks and it's still too expensive here, let alone in British Columbia. But we can definitely complain about Phil Verster's salary. It is hundreds of thousands of dollars more than the head of TransLink. I think Doug Ford might think about that when he's deciding exactly how much pay the head of Metrolink should be getting here, let alone whether or not he should still be leading the organization. I mean, look, it's good to know that Ontario, we're not alone on getting screwed over by some local transit authorities. Uh, You know, I don't like to hear that this is happening in BC because I feel bad for BC taxpayers too. Um, but definitely we know we're not alone. It sounds like, you know, folks are getting screwed over in the lower mainland and in the, G- the GTA and Ontario as a whole. So sounds like we got a little bit in common there. Absolutely. I think uh, our premier over here, David Eby, and yours over in Ontario, Mr. Ford, might have a little bit more in common than they maybe would like to admit. <laughs> well, Jay, thank you so much for coming on today. It's always great to chat with you about the issues you guys are facing over there in Ontario. And thank you for shining a light on this important issue of government waste, these out of control $800,000 salary for bureaucrats. You bet. Great to be with you, Carson.